So uh, welcome to the session on sustainability of brands post-COVID. Um, I'd now like to do introductions and um, starting with Ferdis Karas, who is based in Canada and he creates visual media cultures for companies and international organizations. He's a well-known commentator and presenter on branding and has worked on branding for organizations such as UNICEF and UNAIDS. And Yashu Sabo is founder and managing director of KDDL Taratech, which makes watch components for leading Swiss brands. Uh, KDDL Taratech subsidiary company, Ethos, has established India's largest chain of luxury watch stores, retailing over 50 mostly Swiss high-end brands. And I'm uh, Rachel Katanek. I was previously Fleischmann Hillard's uh, senior partner and president of their Great China Operations, but have recently moved to United States to head up their New York operations. Uh, Fleischmann Hillard is uh, one of the largest uh, public relations consultancies uh, in the world. So this session is about sustainability uh, and brands. And the thesis is that COVID has created a subtlety about sustainability um, via the media and consumers are definitely being encouraged to support brands and that are um, uh, inclined to the environment, sustainability and governance uh, through their supply chain. But are these brands going to be more or less sustainable in a fully recovered future, whatever that is, when demand has increased and what more is needed to encourage sustainability? And I want to start with a, a first question for each of you, which is how has COVID changed the importance of sustainability to um, businesses in your market? Um, and does the reality really live up to the hype? And, and first, perhaps we can go with you first. Well, certainly. Thank you very much, Rachel, for that uh, introduction. It's uh, always a great delight to be uh, speaking at Horasis. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of uh, the platform. Now, in terms of uh, your question, I do think that uh, we are meeting this morning with a new uh, variant of COVID that has uh, been uh, announced out of South Africa and has appeared in, in several countries. I've been working on COVID-19 since uh, about March of last year because I do a lot of media on disease prevention. I do think that uh, we are underestimating the impact of uh, COVID uh, on the world and including on business. And let me start by saying that I don't think it's all negative. I actually think that the world will come out of uh, COVID-19 stronger than when we went in. There will be greater international cooperation on certain issues, for example, health, there will be a greater understanding that we are all, after all, one human family, because uh, other than North Korea, which has claimed that n n COVID has never come there, uh, no country has been immune over the last couple of years. And uh, what starts in China has literally gone around the world and affected every single person on the planet one way or the other. So I do think that there's a greater realization that we need uh, international cooperation on uh, certain issues and that we are, after all, on one fragile planet. Uh, the, the same is true for uh, climate change now. Uh, there will be a greater emphasis on climate change simply because uh, of what we have been through on COVID. But there, I'm very much more worried about uh, what we're doing on climate change, uh, and I can come to that in, in another mm. question. Interesting. Yashu, how about you? Uh, are you relatively positive about the sort of outcome of COVID, or do you have a different perspective from, from where you are? And, and what about its influence on sustainability and brands? Thank you, Rachel. Um, you know, I would tend to agree that uh, uh, the impact of COVID is not going to be all negative. I, I certainly agree with that. And uh, one of the things that everybody is, or most of the people do realize, is that it is a fragile, uh, it's a fra fragile planet. And there are things that uh, beyond our control, which will impact everybody. 
And in this light, of course, the sustainability uh, and what we do to, to keep our planet livable is as an important issue, which has been framed very uh, dramatically with, with this whole COVID issue and, and, and health issues which, which come about. Uh, so, yes, this is uh, certainly a hot topic for the moment. Whether it's sustainable or not, I think time is going to tell because, as everybody knows, uh, sustainability is a buzzword. Everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon uh, to get a lot of brownie points, hoping that it will catch. Uh, we don't know. I think it remains to be seen. And I think a lot of it has to be driven or will be driven, must be driven by what the consumers eventually uh, what is the preference of consumers? And I'm not sure if that is just going to be, uh, you know, that's going to be changed permanently just because of COVID. Because, yeah, there is a lot of talk. And, you know, I heard a talk when uh, uh, Greta Thunberg, of course, has a lot of followers. But if you see young people, and we depend a lot on young people and their preferences, uh, there is still a lot of unsustainable practices that the young people follow. So I'm not sure if if the talk really matches up to the, the hype, sorry, the, 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 the actions uh, match up to the, to the talk, uh, which, is being, uh, which is being sort of spewed all over the place. But I guess if businesses and there are enough consumers who believe that we need to do something about it to change our lifestyles, businesses will follow consumers. Mm. And uh, I think the jury is still going to be out on that for a while. And maybe it takes, I have to be, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say this, but maybe it's going to take more than just one COVID pandemic. Maybe it's going to be other crises, which is going to keep adding to this message that guys are going to wake up. And when consumers wake up, businesses will certainly follow. Mm. So just on consumers, I mean, what are they actually demanding now? What are you seeing in your business um, that, uh, they weren't demanding before. Um, how is it actually impacting the services, um, the, the, the communication that you provide? Um, and are we seeing it from any particular consumer groups um, or is it, is it sort of a, a wider consumer audience per se? Either of you, yeah. Well, let me start off. Um, I do think that there's uh, been a dramatic shift uh, to uh, digital, the digital economy uh, that we have in COVID come out of it with everybody going online for almost everything uh, that they didn't do before. And that has necessitated, that, it, that has both created challenges and opportunities. But uh, the challenges, of course, is that you suddenly now, if you go online, have instead of a small business uh, where people might have been walking into a store, for example, you suddenly have the possibility of having a global uh, audience for your business. Uh, but that also means that you have to produce uh, and, and uh, be able to communicate with people on different cultures and different geographies and different boundaries. Uh, and that has created a, a lot of challenges. Uh, I do think that uh, the transformation would have happened anyway, but it was accelerated by COVID, uh, and that some uh, sectors of the economy, for example, education, will probably never go back to uh, what it was. I think that online education is something permanent uh, that will stay uh, as a result of, uh, of COVID. So communications in, in my field of communications, it is completely transformed because suddenly uh, people have to realize that they have to reach the entire world online uh, and that uh, branding and brand building is become a much more complex uh, organized, uh, way uh, of, of communicating and, and you know, uh, I'm a visual communicator in the sense that I create visual communications. I mean, nobody reads reports anymore. Uh, if you create a report, uh, I think that, uh, and you don't create visual communications to go along with it, 
uh, I don't think you're going to get your point across. So uh, it's it's a new digital age uh, where almost every person on this planet is uh, is reachable if the government allows it. Of course, there are a few governments that don't allow you to reach everybody. But if you can be reached, if governments allow it, uh, then almost every person on this planet is uh, reachable, and that has that has created a seismic shift in our thinking. I mean, I think the digital um, acceleration is, is well known, but for small businesses, how easy is it actually to uh, become an online business? And for for businesses like you know the the watch business that you're in, Yashu which is very much about tangibility, I guess. Um, you know, how, how easy are you seeing it to transform to this online world? Um, and, and is that what your uh, consumers are demanding in terms of a sustainability approach? Well, I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to play into to, uh, significantly on sustainability, but let's say, and I'm taking jewelry and watches, let's say, in a, in a, in a, in a context together, um, there is a move from the large brands and, of course, the smaller ones will follow. But let me uh, put that in context. To, to get on with some measures which help sustainability, whether it's use of materials. So in a small way, we see, uh, let's say, exotic animal leathers, uh, which everybody was prizing for you know, for handbags and leather straps and belts, this is more or less out. Many of the very, very top sold after brands now just said that we're going to use only vegan leathers, non-animal leathers. Uh, so these are these are nice steps, and they're you know they spread the message. They make it like a USP. But in the end, I'm 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 not really convinced that it's a large enough move. Mm -hmm. um, there is talk about circular economy, we will recycle more and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I, I'm a little skeptical as to how much difference it will really make. But what I do believe uh, some of the luxury businesses are, are doing is promoting the culture against use and throw. So the luxury watch business, I mean, a watch is, is pretty much a a non-functional thing. Nobody needs a watch to tell the time. Everybody uses the phone, which is, uh, you know, far more uh, accurate and convenient. But what they're saying is, look, here is a product which you buy for the pleasure, but you keep it for 50 years. And uh, unlike a smartwatch or unlike a phone, you don't have to throw it away every two years. And I think somewhere in young people, there is, I see a certain tilt that, yeah, this use and throw culture is something which at least we want to try to get away with it. Whether they're going to get away from it or not, I'm not sure. But uh, as I said, businesses are making, brands are making the shift. For a small business like us, which we, we work with the brands and we supply to the brands, there is a move that uh, we need to get the basics in place, the certifications required. Uh, and what this does is it spreads the message, mm. right? In organizations, in our factories, in our stores, they are, we are putting in processes uh, to spread the message of sustainability. Small steps at the moment, but uh, I hope they will become larger steps. And most importantly, I think to our staff, to our consumers, it starts to reinforce the message that there is everybody is talking about sustainability. Yeah. So I think there is a groundswell that could happen, but I think it needs a lot more and it needs to be sustained. Uh, but yeah, there, there is bright sparks there and I'm, I'm hopeful it will happen. Hmm. Interesting what you say about, um, you know, people are starting to talk about sustainability from a business perspective. I think that one of the issues a lot of businesses face is that they look at sustainability as an adjunct to their business rather than necessarily as embedded into the structural process. And, um, you know, for example, uh, Patagonia has just announced, or uh, recently announced, it was no longer going to have a sustainability officer because it believed that everything, everyone should have sustainability as part of their role. 
and and I th- I'm interested in your perspective on how businesses should structurally support sustainability. Is a, 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 a business is still seeing it as something that is is an addition to their their normal process, or are they really uh, structuring to make it part of every single thing that they do? Where are we yeah. on that continuum? If I may, um, um, I think there is there is this uh, transformation taking place. It's it's early days, but if you remember, let's say twenty years ago, you know, brands or businesses would say, "I produce a high quality," or they would say, "I am transparent." Today, if you're a responsible business, you don't really say this anymore. Because, you know, it's assumed that you produce a high quality product and it's assumed that you are transparent to your customers, to your employees. If you are not, you know, it's it, it's not going to be long before there's someone going to sort of, uh, you know, pull the plug and, and, and then you're on the defensive. Uh, is sustainability integrated into the companies in the same way? Uh, no, I don't think so. It is an adjunct at the moment. So in the end, you have a sustainability report, which everybody files and, 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 you know, sort of attracts someone's attention, say, hey, guys, we've got a sustainability report here. But I think over the next few years, responsible companies will start to see sustainability as an integral part of their way of doing business, much like quality, transparency, fairness to employees. Uh, this, is, this is not something you want to talk about right now. It's assumed. I hope this is the change that's going to happen. Uh, yeah, I think some, uh, let's say, uh, far-sighted companies will take the lead and the rest will follow. Peter, any views on that? Let, let me tie in uh, watches and COVID and sustainability. Um, so starting with starting with uh, watches, so I uh, have ordered a new uh, Apple Watch uh, in the middle of October. I'm still waiting for it at the end of November. There are um, two constraints uh, that are happening right now. Obviously, the first one is the chip constraint mm-hmm. uh, on on the supply chain, but the other one, which has really got me a bit exercised, is the batteries. Uh, and uh, and in quartz uh, watches, as an example, but there's just obviously uh, battery watches very small. But you know we've just come out of COP uh, 26, and uh, the whole world is suddenly saying uh, the entire political and and business leadership of the world is is moving towards batteries, which is uh, to me quite alarming, actually. Uh, because I have dealt with the fallout uh, of uh, these issues in countries like the Congo, where I've worked very extensively, and in Myanmar, where I've worked mm-hmm. very extensively. And the the real worry is that where are the components for all these batteries going to be coming from as the world moves towards uh, saying, well, we shouldn't be driving uh, gas uh, or petrol uh, in Asia. It's called petrol uh, cars. Uh, We should all move towards uh, electric cars. uh, And and the implications of those kinds of shifts over the next, say, 10 to 20 years are going to be enormous. And the reason I bring this up is that people don't realize that about 66% of the world's export of cobalt comes from the Congo. And the Congo is one of the most unstable countries in the world. I have dealt, for example, with sexual violence uh, a great deal in Congo uh, because it has one of the highest rates of rape in the world. And the reason it does that is because there are many artisanal, what they call artisanal mines, and then uh, are, are based on cobalt. Uh, and and the implications for in supply chains for every single company that uses a battery, regardless of or or high tech industries that you use them in screens or um, the defense industries that use it use uh, them extensively, they all have to look at the sustainability of uh, of their supply chain. 
The second one is Myanmar. And Myanmar is one of the uh, countries that cr- produces what are called REEs, which are rare earth elements, mm-hmm. sometimes called REMs, rare earth minerals that go again into things like your know, computer screen and batteries and so on. Myanmar has had a coup in uh, February. There's no doubt that uh, there is a great deal of repression going on in Myanmar right now. Now, China uh, takes almost all of Myanmar's REEs at the moment after the coup, and China controls about 80% currently of the world's REE production and refinement because you have to separate out the materials in REEs, which are very difficult to do. So the whole world comes out of a cop uh, and says, well, we just got to move towards batteries. Uh, And uh, and I'm thinking, okay, well, obviously you haven't been to the Congo and you haven't seen what's happening in Myanmar and you don't understand who is actually controlling how it is done uh, in in China right now. So, uh, you know, um, I do think there's a lot of education that needs to go on about sustainability, uh, a, a lot more, a, a lot greater and deeper analysis. By the way, there are governments that realize that China has 80% of the mm. REs and, and uh, are now trying desperately to find other sources of them. Uh, but And <laughs> one of the biggest sources discovered recently is, believe it or not, in North Korea, uh, and so, uh, again, uh, we're going to have the, the, uh, the problem of how do you get REs out of North Korea and whether, and again, it'll be China that gets all the REs out of North mm. Korea if they do. So, um, so, uh, you know, a, a tiny thing like a watch, uh, to, you know, a seismic shift that we're trying to do with every car, uh, in, in the world. Uh, over the next 20 years, all have enormous implications uh, on the supply chain and the sustainability uh, of uh, these supply chains and, and the ESG app implications uh, that go all the way down to the actual person who is, you know, being oppressed or, or uh, having their human rights uh, violated because the cost of these minerals has uh, has gone up uh, fantastically. Yeah. Yashu, any, any perspective on what Ferdas has just said? Yeah, this is very, uh, very interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, for, for every change that happens, there is uh, a positive, and I guess there is a pretty serious negative what happens with all these batteries. I'm, I'm just assuming, and I have no knowledge about this, that with this seismic shift, as you said, and what is, is such a small part of it, with, with uh, electric vehicles, it's going to be such a huge uh, infrastructure for manufacturing batteries and the use of all these uh, rare elements and, and, and stuff like this. I, I, I'm really no information, but I think it's very important that together with this, there is a, a equal infrastructure coming up for the responsible disposal or after treatment of, of stuff like this. And, uh, and of course, it's a business opportunity. I guess what will determine the future is how all of this is priced. I mean, the pricing of a lot of our products really determines how responsibly we use them from water to, to petrol to, to, to everything, right? And uh, yeah, it, it's this is something new that I never thought about, but it's uh, it's a very valid thought, mm. very interesting. Yeah, I, I, and pricing is 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 one issue, but it also goes to um, you know the the divide between developing countries and developed countries, and if we if we think about um, brands operating in in developing countries. Um, versus the likes of Coca Cola or Nestle, who are global and and you, I mean, well, you, very very established. But should should uh, companies, in terms of their sustainability approach, be held to the 
same standards in developing countries as in developed countries, uh, and and is is it unfair, in fact, um, for for small uh, emerging uh, businesses to be held to the same standards? Um, what's your perspective on that? Well, I I think it's not about only about developing countries and developed countries. I think it's about size of organizations. Large organizations, of course, need to take the lead. And therefore, I think they need to be held to higher standards, uh, not only because they have more resources, but because they have the power to influence is much larger than that of smaller companies. So I think uh, no matter where they operate, larger companies need to be held more accountable. But that doesn't mean that smaller businesses are let off the hook. I think there needs to be stronger legislation, stronger, let's say, safeguards and standards that uh, that everybody needs to, uh, all businesses need to reach. Uh, but it has to be led by the larger uh, by the larger companies, and therefore, I think also by the developed countries more than developing countries. There will be arguments in developing countries, and not all of them are valid, but some of them are uh, about you know how. Uh, the largest part of, uh, uh, let's say, the e- ecological disaster was created by developed countries, and why uh, developing countries need a longer time to 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 come up to uh, same standards and so on. I think this is a matter of negotiation, and uh, uh, I, I hope this this is going to be happening, and uh, it's not going to be just like you know. Everybody just holds, uh, just takes a, a very weird stand, and let's say that okay, if you're going to sink, let's all sink together. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I just think that uh, it's it's too opportunistic. Yeah, Ferris. Yeah, I I agree with Yasho. I mean, uh, uh, both of us uh, come from India, and uh, I do think that you know, uh, developing countries have have obviously. Had short drift in the world uh, for for many many years, uh, f- first under colonization and more recently as independent countries. But they have to have lived with the legacy uh, of what colonization gave them. Um, I do think that um, uh, the world needs to come together. Uh, that we need to look forward, uh, and looking forward does mean that. Perhaps there will be a greater burden now on developing countries in certain aspects. But I think that uh, people underestimate the size of uh, the economies of China and India uh, and and uh, the strength of their uh, political and b- business leadership uh, and the ability for them to make changes uh, both inter- internally within their countries and to lead change uh, internationally. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, there is a, the, the relationship with China that the world uh, is, uh, is undergoing right now, a transformation of the relationship, if I can call it that. When I first went to China, Rachel, you probably know much more than I do about China, but when I first went to China, um, everybody was in a Mao suit. Uh, this was uh, in the, especially in the rural areas. They were still wearing bow suits, and I've been to China many, many times uh, since then. Um, and and you know, growing up in India, I watched a transformation uh, from of a very, very insular country. Uh, India was an extremely insular country when I was growing up. Uh, I mean, when you when you left India, for example, to travel outside, you were given something like twelve pounds. Uh, to for your entire trip, I mean, it was seven dollars. Seven dollars. It was just complete. It was entered in your passport as to how much money you took. Right. I mean, it yeah. was you know, it was a very insular, isolated uh, country, yeah. uh, and obviously, it, it also has transformed. Perhaps not as much as China. I mean, the transformation uh, from Mars to China today is, is absolutely enormous. And one can marvel at the fact that they've taken hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Uh, one can marvel at the economic strength of, of China, but one can also despair at the political implications of China. 
uh, and and the bipolarization of of the world that's now happening, uh, and the the kind of fraught relationship that many countries have with China and China with uh, these countries, and that that is simply a, a new thing that we all have to deal with uh, uh, politically and diplomatically. And I think uh, going forward, if China and India don't come aboard certain uh, parts uh, of uh, of this transformation and sustainability. I mean, to give an example, it's well known that in COP26, China and India almost torpedoed the agreement at last minute because they wanted an exemption from coal. Uh, and so some negotiation happened, the last minute negotiation happened, and, and they changed the wording. Uh, from facing out coal to facing down coal. I'm not sure what the big difference was. But anyway, uh, uh, they, they almost torpedoed the international agreement. Uh, and China and India, by the way, were on the same side, which they, they aren't very often on the same side of things uh, at the UN, but this time they were. Um, so I do think that that if China and India don't come on board, uh, the rest of the world can can uh, you know w- with their population bases and their economies, the rest of the world can decide anything uh, on virtually any subject. It's not going to make much difference. Uh, so uh, the political leadership and the business leadership of China and India are critical uh, to our future. Uh, as a planet, uh, and and we need to engage, especially with the government of China. I think India, uh, India's uh, government and economy are, are quite well understood. China is still not very well understood, and they still very much control uh, the economy. And, and so we need to engage with the uh, government of China uh, internationally much, much more. Uh, than we are right now, uh, and and understand where China is and where it's going to be in twenty twenty five years uh, from now, uh, and treat it with with much more respect and uh, and uh, equality than we have been uh, in the past. A confrontation with China, I don't think, uh, will get us anywhere as a planet. I, I want to s- sort of switch gears a little bit. Um, uh, and, and look at the consumer. And you talk about China. And, and one thing that is interesting uh, for me is that while um, there, is, there is certainly a lot um, from a structural point of view that China is doing to uh, implement sustainability initiatives, um, the Gen Z consumer um, wants sustainability at a superficial level, but are they really embracing it in their day-to-day actions? Um, yet, in, in, I think this is not just uh, in, in China. I think that there is a disparity between what consumers want and then how they behave. Um, and how do we close that gap? How do we, how do we actually encourage, from a branding perspective, um, you, you know, the behavioural change that is, is also needed from a sustainability perspective? Um, well, on the other hand, um, you know, the large companies that are putting the resources in are often the first to get accused of greenwashing as well. So they're, they're caught in a dilemma between having to lead the way, but then um, also faced with consumers who want the best of both worlds, um, you know, companies do the work, but not necessarily make the behavioral change themselves. Well, that's exactly what I do. I create behavior change communications, uh, and I create two kinds of behavior change communications. One where you're trying to communicate to the viewer to get them to change their behavior, and two, and the second type is what I call a catalyst video, where you're simply getting a discussion going, and it's just a discussion uh, and peer pressure and so on that changes the behavior and not what you're trying to do directly. We can't impose behavior change on anybody, uh, no matter how much we try. Every consumer has to uh, come to their own conclusion to change their behavior. You can't impose that externally. Uh, What you can do is educate the consumer uh, and, and create what I call cognitive dissonance in the person's head so that they have an alternate way of thinking and of doing 
than what they've already done. And then they come to their own conclusion that they should change their behavior. It'll take time. It'll take a great deal of effort. Uh, and it'll have to be sustained uh, and it'll have to be done seriously uh, to change uh, people's minds and to bring them along, uh, to bring the consumer along on a global basis. It, it's not going to be easy. It's a very complex uh, subject, uh, but I think it's doable. I think that uh, I think that it'll be done on a kind of country by country basis, obviously, um, but even internationally on the international stage, uh, there are there, we need leadership uh, that does that. Uh, and and you know the the world, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, young people will tell you that the world uh, does a lot of blah blah blah, as I've been hearing, <laughs> and not much doing. You know, and and that I you know you got to give young people credit for saying that, and that's quite often the case. Uh, and and we have to stop with the talking and and do and start the, the doing. I think in order to save the planet, you know, Canada is in a very awkward position. For climate change is one of the few, and, and New Zealand too, for that matter, is one of the few countries. Uh, I think Canada, New Zealand, which will actually benefit from climate change if the climate warms up a bit. It's snowing outside my door right now. Um, but, uh, but I think obviously, uh, you know, that's a joke. I think obviously on a, on a planetary basis, we need to, we need to take climate change much more seriously. We need to change the consumer's opinions. Uh, and we need to do that by creating cognitive dissonance in every single person's mind and having them come to their own conclusion that they need to take things like climate change much more seriously. I uh, I think it's going to be a very very difficult uh, task. Let's take uh, just uh, two minutes. Uh, just take the example of the fashion business, right? It's mm. it's 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 so central to younger people today, and with all the the social media and Instagram and so on, I think the number of clothes that are produced is. Someone told me my my daughter is in the textile in the garment business, and she told me that eighty percent of the clothes which are produced are never are never really worn, and this is such a huge waste. And I really don't see that the behavior of young people is going to change so fast. In fact, I'm afraid that it's changing on the other side, where there's much more buy and throw because you need to wear a dress once, you need to put it on. On social media, a couple of times, and you cannot be seen dead, uh, you know, in the same thing thrice. So, uh, yeah, I think that I started by saying it has to change. We have to work to change the consumers to do it. But the whole industry is based on the structure of producing a lot, then advertising a lot to create demand for it, and uh, everybody is employed because of it. And then, if if suddenly you were to produce half the number of garments. So many millions will be unemployed everywhere in the world, mostly in the developing countries, and this has its own implications. So, I, I don't have an easy answer for this, but I think it needs a, a huge cooperation, restructuring of whole businesses, uh, along with along with uh, the education of the customer, with uh, you know, with with a lot of uh, change in attitude. It's a tough one, and it will take time. Yes, I think that that is the tension, isn't it? It's the tension between what what the desire and and the the intellectual understanding that something may be good for you, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you want it. And you know that cognitive dissonance that you're talking about, Fertis. It has to uh, there has to be some massive incentives for change in, in many respects um, to, to get that at all levels. Um, it, it, one of the things that um, I'm interested in is also employees of companies and um, what companies are doing, particularly in their sustainability journey, to bring employees along with them. Um, because it seems to me, uh, when talking to many companies uh, that are on, you know, got strong sustainability uh, mandates, that they're not necessarily. Um, uh, bringing their employees uh, along with them and, and not necessarily communicating 
well about what the employee role is in, in the sustainability journey. And I wondered whether you had any perspective on, on that and, and how companies can not only improve their communication to, to, to consumers and other stakeholders, but also to their employee group. Well, I think you're totally right, Rachel. Uh, companies need to do this, especially larger companies need to look internally uh, and and look at every aspect of the company because quite often there's a small slice of a company uh, that's looked at at change and and people need to have a more holistic view uh, and look at every aspect, everything on the supply chain, every uh, person uh, within the company, regardless of of uh, which part they're in. You know, right now companies are, I don't know about uh, where you are, but at least in in, uh, North America and Western Europe and so on, companies are uh, perhaps not so much in Asia, companies are uh, struggling with mandates on COVID uh, with their employees uh, and everybody is all over the place. uh, Whether you can uh, mandate uh, that a, a person be vaccinated or not, uh, and this is all going through court systems in multiple jurisdictions and so on. So the leadership of companies has come under great strain uh, over the last uh, short while because of COVID, to go back to your first question. Uh, and I think that we will set certain parameters with COVID that will uh, tell us whether or not we can mandate uh, various things as a leadership in the company. Almost every leader of every large company will tell you that they are engaged on sustainability. There isn't one that's going to say, no, we don't care about it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, (laughs) there isn't one that's going to say we don't. But that's, that's again, the the question is, okay, you talk and you do. And uh, is talking and doing the same. Uh, And, you know, it's not always the case. And I can think of many companies Going back to this, uh, to the battery issue, for example, where, uh, where companies just, you know, uh, companies that make watches, for example, quartz watches that have batteries, uh, in a large way, uh, and Apple's the biggest one of them must be realizing that cobalt, uh, comes from Congo. They must know that. They must know that there's a supply chain problem. They must know that China uh, is now controlling most of the mines in the Congo, uh, and uh, and China gets a lot of the REEs, 80% of the REEs that go into batteries. It's known. So the, the question comes up, uh, not in the future, but today, before other sources are found and so on, what are these companies doing, very large companies doing, about the supply chain that goes into their product? Uh, and and there's a there's a lot of evidence uh, that that major companies, even though they might get up at the AGM and say, um, you know, uh, we we are um, uh, uh, on sustainability, and you know, this is a very big issue. People have to ask pointed questions at AGMs. Uh, they have to get up there, have to challenge the leadership, ask pointed questions. You know, where is this product coming from? I should mention the garment industry. The garment industry has gone through some transformation uh, already. Uh, the, the conditions, for example, in the garment industry in Bangladesh, uh, where where it suddenly became an issue to the forefront when there were some fires and, and people died. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, people now, you know, we live in a global age. We live in an age of instant communications so that if there's a fire in a, in a garment factory in Bangladesh, I can know about it sitting in my office in Ottawa, Canada, halfway around the world instantly. I can react to it instantly. I can uh, pass it around to my friends. I can make it a big issue if I, if I choose to uh, engage in it. So the, the, implications of these kinds of instant communications we have only just begun in in human history we have never had this uh, ability to interact uh, so much uh, with what's happening half around the world and now it has started and now i think that we we are actually uh, coming to the realization that these kinds of things these kinds of changes need to happen 
Okay. Yes, I know you have to leave um, very soon. So I just want to ask one question. Are you pessimistic or optimistic about the sustainability in brands in the future? That's the question I'm afraid of. Oh, But, okay. you know, we have to be optimistic. There are a lot of things to be done. There are a lot of sort of red flags up there. But if you're not, if you're not optimistic, then it's already, the battle is already lost. So I'm optimistic and uh, working hard to do it. Okay. No, I'm optimistic. also optimistic, uh, Rachel, uh, not just uh, about sustainability, but I generally think the world's going in the right direction. Uh, even though I deal with horrific issues like rape and so on around the world. Great. Well, thank you very much both for this session. It's been an interesting discussion and uh, one that I'm sure that we will continue to have as uh, this issue really becomes front and center of everyone's um, agenda. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.